It's the only wrestling podcast on earth with myself, Dennis Farrell, and Lars Fredrickson from the band Rancid, who just got back from Bound for Glory. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about this because I'm jealous I didn't get to go. I saw the picture. I almost photoshopped myself in the picture, by the way. And uh, it, it, I am so happy that you and PD got to hang out and meet. I'm so jealous I wasn't there. But uh, we'll we'll definitely talk about your experiences. I'm sure, if not on this podcast, on another one. We have Kevin Gill, the voice of GCW, with us tonight. Kevin, A, thank you so much for hanging out with us. First of all, I would like to say what up, though, to everybody tuned in, not just around the Michigander area, but all around the wrestling world, because wrestling perspective is where it's at. And I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to make the cut to be on your esteemed list of guests. Why are you lying to us? Nobody is excited to be here. Not even Lars is excited to be here. He's Come here. On. He's court ordered to be here every week. Yeah, he's under under duress. That's true. Yeah. It's essentially. Uh, my first question, and I'm going to actually throw this to Lars. My first question is, Lars, uh, Kevin is like one of those voices that I knew just through GCW. How did you become friends with Kevin Gill? When did he become on your radar? Well, I mean, we've been friends a couple decades now, I would say. And, uh, you know, in the punk and hardcore scene, especially here in the Bay Area, it's it's it can be small at times. And Kevin was obviously somebody who you'd see around because you can't miss him because he's like fucking eight <laughs> feet tall. Right. But he would be at every fucking show. You know what I mean? And I think we just he we just started a conversation. And of course, uh, you know, found very quickly our love of professional wrestling, the, the king of sports. And as a result, I mean, we've done I mean, we've worked together, uh, under, you know, we have promoted a, a wrestling show together. We've done commentary together. Um, you know, he's such a, a gifted guy and he's such a knowledgeable, um, you know, commentator. You know, that's one of the things about Kevin is and I'm just going to talk like you're not here for a second, Kevin. But like, <laughs> you know, he's very knowledgeable. He's quick. He's witty. And as as a as a as a commentator, I think he's one of the best in the biz. You know what I mean? And um, you know, other than our friendship, like I enjoy listening to Kevin, you know, call matches and things. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how we. Would you say that's an accurate uh, assessment of how we met, Kev? Yes. Uh, what's interesting though is that we we reconnected when I moved to San Francisco. We had right. first met and bonded over wrestling on the East Coast. Uh, at an H H two O concert, that is I was correct. there with H. I was there at an H two O show, and me and some people were in the back talking about wrestling all day. And uh, at some point, you we didn't even we didn't know who you were. You came over to us and were like, "Excuse me, guys, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, I couldn't help but overhear you were speaking about wrestling. Like, do you mind if I join you or something?" And we're like, "Oh fuck yeah!" So we bullshitted about wrestling for a while, and so much so that. We could, I could hear the stage introductions for H2O going on and stuff, and we're still all talking. And I'm, you know, me, I'm normally the first person to be watching the band, so it's, it speaks to the value of the conversation. But there was a moment in the conversation that I'll never forget if I ever get to make a movie, this scene's in it. And you're talking about like junkyard dog or whatever, and then someone nudges you, and you're like, guys, can you just bear with me for just, just literally two minutes? I'll be right back. And then you hear on stage, Toby's like, oh. Uh, our special guest Lars from Ranch is going to come out and play guitar on this song. And you walk out on the stage, play guitar on the song. I mean, all my friends are like, oh, wow, that's Lars from Rancid. And then you come back and are like, so anyway, JYD, red pants <laughs> <and> chain. <laughs> so we hung out that night, but then I didn't see you for a few years. But I ran into you in San Francisco and you were like, I always, you said to me, uh, you're like, I don't know your name. But I know that you like wrestling, like I like wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then uh, connected ever since. That's All right, fair. you being the voice of GCW, GCW over, I'd say a fair assessment, the last year and a half has really exploded. You've been there kind of, I wouldn't say from the beginning, but you're part of the explosion. You're the voice of it. Uh, my favorite is when Ron Funches is on. It's one of my dream <laughs> interviews. You guys have turned... Uh, I, you know what, uh, and this is going to sound critical, but you guys have turned guys like Matt Cordona, who is just seems like he's always spinning his wheels in wrestling, should be bigger, never quite did it. You turn him into a superstar. You turn a guy like Ron Funches, who has always been funny, 
uh, a great career in television and comedy, and you turn him into a a, a wrestling star. You you make newsmakers. Did you, how did you guys figure out the secret formula to taking some of these guys that just didn't seem like they were going to get over the hump and make it happen where Impact couldn't quite do it, WWE couldn't quite do it, but GCW did it. Well, that, I mean, that's all uh, Brett Lauderdale. Brett Lauderdale is a genius, you know what I mean? He keeps uh, a handful of people around him that throw in ideas and stuff, but 99.8% of it is just his his vision and his idea and just watching the market and whatever and and he gives us or gives me us whoever very free reign on commentary i normally don't know anything that's going to happen at all and i prefer it that way sometimes you can't help but know where you you know but it was funny like the night uh, matt cardona debuted he was in that hooded gimmick all day like i saw him throughout the day but i did not know i was just looking at sizing him up being like oh i think it's moxley you know what i mean but the commitment was that he was kayfabe to everyone, you know what I mean, uh, prior to the show. So Brett is the guy that has that that booking vision and multiplied with the, the talent that's there. And that's the spark. And the audience is like gasoline, you know what I mean? So they, they just erupt and it, it's like the perfect storm. And then I'm there kind of trying to absorb all that and what I know from the past and present and the broad strokes of where stuff's going and just try to it's always a balance where you're trying, there's so many new people watching every show. So you want to be entry level enough that anyone who's just tuning in can fully be drawn in. But at the same time that there's still stuff there for the people that are, which there's a lot of them that are watching every show every time. So it's a, it's, it's like a dance, but it's an honor for me to be a part of it. Uh, my first show for them was Joey Janela's spring break one. Love Joey. And, Friend uh, of the show. <laughs> Yes, a great, a great man, a great wrestler. And what more could you really be in life? <laughs> Rock star. Not much, not much. Yeah, I mean, right, um, you can, can only do two. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, you know, one of the things that I notice about this company in particular, and one of the reasons why I'm such an uber fan of it, not only did you expose it to me how many, so many years ago, but it's, it's as if everybody on that roster is fucking hungry. And it's like the one thing that lacks in, I would say, a few promotions that I do watch uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. What the end, the, there's a dedication and uh, a loyalty, Derek, if, if, I, if I could say that, to that promotion. What is that, you know, uh, what, what do you think being there is creating that environment? I think it's just the philosophy, like, uh... Brett always refers to it as like, we're the last outlaws, you know what I mean? So it's kind of a, a, a group of people bound together by their, their passion and love for the industry, their desire to perform. A lot of people in a way you could consider them the misfit toys or whatever. They're the people that didn't fit in here or there or weren't accepted, but at the same time, they're undeniable, uh, especially when they have a platform and now they have a platform and it doesn't matter if you're black, white, gay whatever your gender is like you're in that arena you're in that world and you're making it happen and it's it's wild uh uh what was that one city we went to uh uh was it montana oboken no it was like way in the middle i can't think of it right now brett will fucking be mad at me but uh Sorry, we went brett. to some town in the middle of nowhere you know what i mean beautiful town and you don't know what they're going to think like, oh, like, what are they going to think of of these wrestlers and this show? I mean, they did call the police, but, you know, the <laughs> well, show was now we know. Yeah, they, the neighbors called the police because they thought Nick Gage and uh, I think it was Nick Gage and Matthew Justice had the match. And they thought that it turned into a, like a murder, attempted murder or whatever. It's just pro wrestling. Is there a worry? <laughs> that GCW could become too big for its britches. And I mean it from the aspect of you found a nice little niche on Fight TV, which we're part of. Hi, everybody on Fight. Um, and you see it happen where some of these companies grow maybe a little too big or, you know, they have their niche fans and then they get bigger and it's, oh, GCW sold out. Now they're on TBS or, or whatever, WGN or whatever at 2 a.m. on a Saturday Any night. letters. Yeah, is there is there that kind of worry where 
as as much popularity as GCW is gaining in the wrestling community, I could almost just say, up until uh, you know, depending on when this airs, a couple of days ago, you guys might have been more popular than Ring of Honor at the time. Is there a worry that maybe there's that perception of we go from outlaws to sellouts? I think it's always listening to the audience, and I think that's one thing that GCW does. I think better than any wrestling company in the world because every wrestling company in the world has a built-in focus group every night that attends their events and they have a built-in focus group online that'll provide all this data if you're willing to look at it. And a lot of people seem to get off on booking stuff that make the audience mad and everything's based on everyone being unhappy, but look at the world we live in. You know what I mean? Like let's have some fucking fun. Let's, let's enjoy this. And I think that, that, that truth, that reality comes through. It's performers doing what they want at the level that they want. There's no restrictions. If you're in the first match, steal the fucking show. If you're in the main event, steal the fucking show. You know what I mean? So I don't know. It's kind of like a, a different animal in a way. So I, I, I don't know that we're as susceptible to it because a lot of companies lose, they get high on their own supply and they kind of get all their head up their own ass and they stop listening to the audience for some reason. And I think you should never stop listening to the audience. And as those stars are made again and again in GCW and some of them go on to be the stars of AEW or, or other places, and some of them are still a part of GCW. But I, to me, it's just something that's going to keep going because it's very, it's very well thought out. Like you'll see a lot of people try to copy it and they don't get the same results because you know what I'm saying? It, it's more than just, I think, what GCW is doing. It's how it's doing it. And when it's doing it, you have to do these things at the right time with the right groundswell of support. And I think GCW does a really good job of, of managing that. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's often imitated, never duplicated. You know what I mean? And I think with GCW, it's got one of those vibes like ECW. I mean, you were there for those shows, you know what I mean? And seeing that, you know, pop off the way it did. Um, Man. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I, I feel like, you know, when you have, and I, let me ask you this, how important it is because, it, you know, GCW has something for everybody. So if you like the death match, we're going to have one of those. If you like the high flyers with a lot of spots, we got one of those. If you want a, a you know, three-way dance, we got one of those. You want, you know, whatever it may be, you know what I mean? All different kinds of styles. You got guys like Effie, you know, you got, got you know, got obviously Nick Gage, you know, you got guys like Cardona now. You got guys like Ninja Mac, who's one of my personal favorites, but it's all got a place there. So is that like sort of, um, how can I say it? Is it, are these shows, um, are, they, are they looked at as like, well, we need this match, this match, this match, and this match, and this match? Well, I feel like there's certain essential ingredients, but I guess it's all the straw that stirs the drink and how they're presented and when. Um, nine out of 10 times, I feel like you're always gonna get something similar to what you described but then if you go to the nick age invitational or the tournament or survival or whatever you might go to then you're going to get something that's much more uh all violence based or you might get uh, a spotlight kind of show that focuses on a you know a different facet of it but i feel like that that variety show if you will approach definitely covers it because you literally get to see everything you get to see wild brawls high flying shit bloody violence um, technical wrestling, you know what I mean? Where else are you going to see John Gresham and Nick Gage on the same show okay. with Minoru Suzuki, with Alex Zane, with Ninja Mac? Um, yeah, and Effie, you know, it, it's crazy to me. Like the amount of talent that's there, honestly, and I know I'm inside of it, so I have a, a distorted view of it, but I, each week I literally can't believe that someone doesn't, someone in television or whatever, doesn't look at exactly what GCW is right now and just say, this like why why aren't we just releasing half hour episodes right. of what these guys are already shooting or you know let's take it to the next level but to me yeah there's just something magic and essential in the in that sauce it's the perfect storm and it, there's always this vibe of dream matches you never thought you wanted or knew you wanted right that now you must have and they super deliver like every show feels to me it's a super show there's no Oh, tonight we're phoning it in. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
in, in, in a few minutes, I'm definitely going to change my questioning along the lines of you and your career. But before we get into it with the news of Ring of Honor shutting down and, you know, Lars and I were talking about this on the phone earlier today, spoiler alert, and and this wave of talent and what it's going to do for not just the Ring of Honor guys, but the undercard guys. Do you think there's a maybe a trap for GCW that like if we start going after some of these Ring of Honor guys or some of these other main main level guys, we lose our identity and maybe we risk having the fans revolt against us? Because right now, I think you guys are doing a perfect. You sprinkle in a couple guys, you let them go, they come back a month later, and, and you give them what they want, but not enough. But you don't overdo the card with Moxley and Cordona. And there's a trap there where indie companies would try to book everybody they could. Right, because that's TV. Right. <laughs> Rather than maximizing. In other words, sometimes I think a lot of people. Now, again, if you're getting paid actual rights fees, like money, like WWE or AEW is getting paid for your TV, totally different discussion. But on the flip side, I think a lot of people get caught up in the hocus pocus of we're television rather than being a live event and pay-per-view business. Do you know what I mean? And I think if you look at it as a live event and a pay-per-view business uh, that also tells stories, but you don't get as locked into that concrete thinking that leads to the downfall of having too many of the people all around at the same time and trying to tell all these nuanced stories on the same two-hour or three-hour experience, you know? And, and by the way, Lars, it looks like Kevin is being held hostage against his will. So blink twice if you need help or hold up a newspaper with today's date so we know that this interview is current. Wait, me or Lars? You. You look up. You're against the brick wall. I should ask you to turn left <laughs> for a picture. Like All I have is I have these dates written down. I can show you that. That's perfect. <laughs> perfect. All right. We know that you're alive and well. All right, Lars. Smiling. If I had the mask on, then I could understand, but. I try to try to smile to let people know I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you surprised in any way, shape, or form that I mean? Okay, so I was talking to Matt Cardona down at at, at, at Bound for Glory, and we had about a 15 minute conversation. We and we mostly talked about his work in GCW. Are you surprised the amount of attention that the company got because of what happened? <laughs> Well, I guess nothing surprises me, to be honest, at, about GCW, but I, was I incredibly pleasantly surprised, um, especially when I, I look and see, like at the time, right after that happened, I went and looked and I'm like, is Matt Cardona still on Impact? Like, I didn't know for sure. And then I went and looked and I'm like, oh yeah, he's, he was on TV last week, he's on TV this week, but it's happening in a, in a, a, a smaller bubble somehow, or maybe a bubble that's not as active online or whatever it might be. But yeah, as, as Matt Cardona will tell you, and he probably did mention, it was the number one trend in America. It was during the Olympics and during a UFC event, and Cardona was still the number one trend over all that. Um, I think that's incredibly validating for him as well, because, uh, you know, as a wrestler, as a persona, we already all watched him break through all the bullshit and get to basically right up near the top, top in terms of popularity, top in terms of merch sales, but politically uh, way held down and kind of undercut. And now he's in a place where there is no undercutting and it's edgy and it's, ah, it's hard to explain. Like I, I, it's not to say that impact and other companies don't have compelling or fun uh, products, but there's just something, look at what he's doing. He's getting to do this crazy stuff that he's so into rather than, okay, I come in every three weeks and I do these eight matches or, or whatever, but that, I don't know. You know what I mean? That's just my, maybe my take on it because it shows you that the world is interested in Matt Cardona and the world is interested in GCW. And then somehow they found out about both and it kind of comes together. Right. But the fact that Matt is currently performing on a highly visible platform somehow doesn't connect with them as much for some reason. And that, that I don't fully know why. It, it, kind of like we said at the top of the show was 
GCW took a guy, once again, like Matt Cordona, who has paved his own way in wrestling, but never broke through the glass ceiling. Somehow he shows up on GCW, which was, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and, and I don't mean to say it discouraging, a little, you know, fight TV wrestling promotion, which there's uh, millions of them on. And then all of a sudden, these two guys marry and take each other to the next level. Yeah. And nobody knows how or why, but it's beautiful. But that's wrestling in a sense. That to me, that's the beauty of professional wrestling and professional wrestling that is uh, driven from the point of view of how can this be great? Not necessarily what can we make out of this? You know what right. I mean? I feel like there's just no, no limits. And uh, because of the buzz GCW gets and is getting, more and more people are, are open to, to doing things, which is half the battle, you know? There's so much stuff that uh, GCW has put to get or tried to put together or had in the works until the last second, and then somebody got cold feet or whatever. So keep in mind the big surprises and these big moments that people get to see are often the result of several that maybe didn't come to fruition. Sometimes even on the same event where something else big happened, there might have been another thing that was planned, but someone got cold feet or whatever. So it, it's always an interesting blend, but even just having guys like Minoru Suzuki, like for him to stand in that ring and be like, I fucking love GCW. Do you know what I mean? Like that, ah. <laughs> that's yeah. like just the, the ultimate. I mean, that guy's a God and that he came to America and spent so much time with us and did so many shows with us. And I'm sure we'll go back to Japan with a very um, positive feeling about the experience. You know what I mean? It's an honor. It's a dream. How can you even imagine? I'm sure you were talking to him Lars in Vegas uh no <laughs> no minoru talk no minoru talk was he there no no he wasn't uh oh because so. you were only there for about for glory yes oh i'm sorry i didn't to... <laughs> no, i just no, no, assumed no. you were there as part of the whole no 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 i only went in for the for the saturday and then sunday i went to the raiders game because that you know that trumps everything but uh um, sure so, but, you know, one of the things, you know, it's like the, they were the perfect, you know, Gage and Cardona are the perfect protagonist and antagonist, you know, yeah, total and opposites and, in every sense of the word. And the, the funny thing about Gage being the protagonist, you know, I mean, that is like the most, you know, because I mean, Cardona is like this, you know, obviously, you know, throughout his career, been a, an uber baby face. I mean, he, you know, he's the bronze, you know, good, you know, good shape. Right. You know, and now, but I mean, it's so funny how like our minds change. It's like the stone cold thing. But so as far as like calling a death match, um, you know, one of the things that I think when I watch those matches and one of the things I love that are, that are so, ex that's so exciting about it, it seems like it's a lot of shit is called on the fly. You know what I mean? And it's, it's a very, um, how would you say organic and it's very, um, not sporadic, but uh, impulsive. You know, it seems like these guys have a, have a good sense of each other and a good sense of what to now do and what to bring. Maybe they plan one or two spots. You can kind of see that sometimes. If you've been watching wrestling for 100 years like I have, you kind of can see that. But um, how do you call, a, is it the same kind of thing to call a death match as opposed to a regular wrestling match? I mean, I guess on in one way it is because I just try to call call what I see, like call what's on the monitor when I have a monitor, and and just just feel it, you know. Um, with the death match, I think there is like another level because it's another level of performance for, from the wrestlers, another level of violence and risk and bloodshed. So I think it's maybe uh, intuitively it's good. The commentary would be even more extreme for some of that stuff just to just to fit the mode, you know what I mean? But in a way, it's still the same premise of, you know what I mean? The, there's people fighting and a story being told in, in the action and there's moments and, you know, uh, there's moments that happen and there's kind of key bits of information that you could maybe give to the people at home to hook them a little bit or help them understand or help them hate particular people more, you know? Well, I mean, because, uh, you know, sorry, Dennis, I want to keep kind of going on this because mm -hmm. you I do watch some promotions that do do death matches and the commentary is the fucking worst. <laughs> I wish I could just fucking mute it because all they all they want to do is drop F bombs and try to like be as uh, and it, it, it turns out to be corny. It's it actually takes sure. away. 
I'm not going to name different promotions. I mean, I, there's three that are popping in my head right now. But my point is, it's like, you know, when I'm watching wrestling, I want that suspension disbelief. I don't need you to drop an F bomb or, or show show me how foul your mouth is. You know, I understand if it's got, you know, if it needs to be said and there's gravity to what you're saying. Yeah, that makes sense. But but just doing it for for no reason other than to be, oh, I'm extreme or whatever. It's <laughs> it's it's kind of it's kind of stupid. You know what I mean? So uh, but I also understand that that can also be the natural way people talk because I drop a lot of F bombs unless, you know, even when my kids are around, I'll admit it. But Sure. I, I guess, I guess, you know, the science of it, I'm wondering, it's like, it, you know, the, one of the ways that you do it is you bring, you bring it in, people in. Now, um, do you think that uh, connecting with the audience, as far as the commentator, is, is it as important as the match that's happening before them? Mm, I don't, I, honestly, I don't think anything is, is as important as the match. I always look at it as, there's a there's a beautiful cake that's been made. It's it, cake's awesome. It's got all this frosting. It's in an amazing box ready to be presented. And I, I might just add some sprinkles to it. You know what I mean? Like so, depending. Now, for example, I've met uh, a bunch of fans over the years who are uh, visually impaired or have no vision at all, and they watch the shows through listening to the commentary. So for them, obviously, I think yes. But for most everybody else, I think the match takes precedent. But I take great pride in trying to add anything, whether it's add something, keep the ball rolling, give a, give a camera direction where needed, whatever I can do to keep that magic, like that energy intact and keep the ball up, so to speak. You know what I mean? Kevin, I want to bring this back one more second to Matt Cordona, and I don't want to be the this to be the <laughs> Kevin Gill talks about Matt Cordona hour. And I'm being very cordial. I normally have a very mo much more pointed when I speak about Mr. Cardona, but out of respect to Lars, I'm, I'm dialing myself down. In in this, and actually, this is probably more of a question meant for wrestling website headlines, but. We saw one of the most iconic moments when he wins the championship. People rain the ring with pizza cutters and beer cans and stuff like that beforehand. And I have to believe that you're in part of the booking and the production. Is Are you guys sitting there? Do you guys have the foresight to understand that this is about to happen to this guy? Do you guys have a plan A or B to <laughs> get him out of the ring? What was the thinking? Because you had to have known you were going to incite a riot here. What was it like <laughs> in the meetings when you were talking about giving this guy this moment and what are we going to do for him when we have to call in a, a, a SWAT team to get him out? Well, I think that the main thing really was just security. You know what I mean? Like he had a lot of it going to the ring and he had a lot of it coming back. Uh, I, I Honestly, I think that was really the only, the only plan was to just have him heavily secured. And of course, you always have a locker room on standby you know what i mean so with the help of the ring crew and and some of the gcw faithful uh who were double agents that night they were able to whisk him to and from the ring and yeah i mean obviously i think everyone knew that people would be unhappy to say the least yeah but the idea that they would like properly melee or whatever uh i didn't i mean i w there was no meeting that i you know what i'm saying like a lot a lot of times too there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one talks that go on rather than kind of a attention everyone sort of thing so everything's very much on a need to know uh basis you know what i mean and and since i do prefer not to know um i'm often not in in that discussion so then this way i have an organic reaction <laughs> but sometimes you know i will see someone backstage and i'll be like oh okay and then later they're running down the aisle well, yeah, you know, I want to take it, take it, go ahead. Sorry, Dennis. I was going to say, that's my last Matt Cardona question, by the way. But I will well, say I, for Matt Cardona, if real quick, one thing I always think about is that, you know, Matt Cardona, again, has this whole uh, career. He made a lot of money. He did a lot of things, sold a lot of stuff, was in a lot of top matches. Uh, as Lars mentioned, he's in, like in impeccable physical condition. You know what I mean? He's immaculate. And then he does one fucking death match and he's all covered in bubbly scars and everything. And that that's like... That's some real shit. Like every time I see him, I'm just looking at his, all his bubbly scars. And that's one time. And it's like, that's some real shit to even do. You know what I mean? Because if you're some, a body guy, if you will, in wrestling, yeah. you know what I mean? You want to keep that impeccable. But then you figure since it's him, 
he'll have a variant action figure that'll that'll show the the battle scar, <laughs> battle scar Matt Cardona. Well, I mean, you got, but honestly, Kevin, I mean, you know, and I know you don't like him so much, but you got to give the motherfucker credit for having yes. the balls. Whoa. For yeah, having big the brass balls. balls. I mean, and yeah. and I think and I think he's turning people around and he's becoming a jo- enjoyable. I know I enjoy every time he hits my screen on GCW. So, but let's take and it his back. Twitter, his Twitter game too. Let's just say that too. Oh. Him and his his fiance's Twitter game. It's up impeccable. a notch, bro. It's <laughs> up a notch. Okay, so you know, let's take it way back. Okay, and how you got your break and how you got your start, or not break. Let's just say how we got your start in 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 professional wrestling. Sure. Well. I had done a few interviews and stuff like that with, you know, with classy Freddie Blassie and Terry Funk and people like that back in the day. But that was, you know, that didn't lead to anything but really compelling interviews. Um, But what ended up happening was uh, I was working on the Backyard Wrestling video game. And that led to me working with and knowing a lot of wrestlers and having to put together a few like kind of press events for it that involved matches. And at one of the matches or the first time we did it was at the E3 Convention Center or the LA Exhibition Center, whatever it's called, the giant fucking place on like Flower and Market, whatever. And uh, we're having these matches, a tournament with like Super Dragon, M-Dog, Matt Cross, uh, Man Man Pondo, a whole bunch of people. And as soon as it started, it just felt flat because there's all these video game industry people there that don't have any vibes for wrestling and they don't know how to... So I just started doing commentary over the PA unplanned uh, just to draw people in and keep it entertaining, compelling, informative or whatever. So I did that for a two or three day tournament and that was fun. But I worked in the video game industry and it was a lot of work and I just kept working. So um, a few years go by and uh, I started refereeing in wrestling. Uh, I got an opportunity to referee for uh, Insane Clown Posse's company, JCW. Uh, and it was nice to them because they brought me in as a referee with no experience and put me in the ring with, you know, people like Vampiro and Man Man Pondo and, and I could, you know, and then on to Roddy Piper and Scott Hall and Kevin Nash or whatever. But the fact that they gave me that opportunity, that's what really got me into wrestling. So then I was re- uh, refereeing a lot and I really liked that. And uh, a great wrestler from the Bay Area named DJ Riz. Uh, mm. from the Suburban Commandos team. He had, he was a, a, a guy Lars and I were both fans of here from indie shows in the Bay. And he passed away, actually, right when I was on my way to the Gathering of the Juggalos to go referee, I got the text. And when I got back, I hit up Lars and I, I wanted to do like a benefit show or do a memorial show or something, but his friends already had that rolling. So then I was like, well, why don't I uh, bring in like a production crew and let's film this show and put it out and uh, Lars at the time was taking a lot of dope pictures. So I asked him if he would be the event photographer. And then we were going to do commentary and post. So I asked Lars if he thought it would be a good idea for me to do commentary on the, the gimmick on the show. And he's like, he gave me a big talk, like, absolutely. And then I don't know if he said it or I said it, but like, who are you going to do commentary with? And then in short order, it was him. So we shot like against green screen. So we have like host segments and everything. And, and we do commentary on the show. And uh, that was then. Now I had a physical calling card, you know. So I went and gave that to the ICP guys. And they had Violent J from ICP. He stepped out of commentary and I stepped into his place, which is insane to say. And then uh, me and Shaggy Tudor were the commentators for JCW. And then after a while, so no more refing than just commentary. And then I started booking the show and then booking the show and running uh, Juggalo Championship Wrestling. And I did that for a bunch of years. But uh, now I'm just focused on GCW and all KG related endeavors. But that's kind of that's the that's the story of how I got in, like those key steps. But having a calling card like a DVD with Lars, all professionally packaged with great wrestling on it to show people. I only had to show one person in this case, but. Maybe if I had shown more, who knows? And <laughs> and I was at my storage space last week, and I discovered a hidden stash of these DVDs that I, quite frankly, did not believe existed anymore. I thought it's been over five years since they've been gone. But I would like to offer to all United States-based listeners of your show, I have 10 copies of this DVD, the DJ Riz Memorial Cup, wow. hosted by KG and Lars Fredrickson. 
And uh, I don't know, however you guys want to give something away, maybe we can do something with Twitter, whatever, but I will uh, fulfill them for you. I will ship them out to people and I want to give away 10 DVDs so people can see me and Lars kill it at commentary. Nice. Thanks, Nick. Nine. You have nine. <laughs> I, okay, I have eleven, so now I have ten. <laughs> I need one of these. I need to watch it because my next question was going to be: Can we watch it online? It does. But, that's the amazing thing. It's not on anything, which is wild because wow. by the end of the the run, so to speak, uh, there were shows here for like Gold Rush Pro Wrestling and Pacifica, and several times I went and just put a DVD on every seat before the show, just because I wanted them to go out while it was still timely. And I didn't think I did not know there was any more, but I found a box you and I want, want them to go somewhere. You need to put it out maybe as a GCW exclusive online as part of like a special event show, because that would be phenomenal to hear Lars Fredrickson on commentary. He did great. He did so great. We brought him back. <laughs> I need to hear this. A, a, I either need. Oh, dude! I'll say it was. It was even sold in Tokyo at a at a world famous tattoo studio. It was a very hot item in Japan. Oh my gosh! How is this not online? <laughs> yeah, it's wild. No one, no one ever ripped it. It's wild to think yeah. about. But now that I have a, a a bunch more, I wanted to put some in your listeners' hands. Maybe they can. Maybe not rip the whole thing, but I would love to see a bunch of clips and shit at the very yeah. least. You should yeah. put it on the GCW. I mean, that would get a ton of eyes on it. <laughs> it might. It might. See what you guys think about it. It's pretty fucking sick. I, 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 mean, we, I we had a really good time doing it, and I remember we, you know, it was that was really fun because I don't think, but I mean, I, I knew sitting next to you though, Kev, that you were a natural at it, and I'll just say that, you know what I mean. Well, I appreciate it. Your encouragement and support has definitely kept me going uh, through all this shit. Much I was just like, fuck you, you fucking punta, you fucking wanker. Get the fuck out of here. Let me ask you this, Tulsa. We've all played video games. We've all played Madden. We've all felt like we could be John Madden or Jim Ross or whatever. And then we try to imitate them when we play the video games or we turn the TV down low and we, we feel like we can do this where did you find your voice? Did you try to patent it or, or mimic somebody else where you thought this was how it should be done? Um, I just, I always loved all the talkers in wrestler in wrestling, anybody who could talk a blue streak. I loved them. It didn't matter if you were Jimmy Valiant or Roddy Piper or Don Morocco or whoever it was, if you could talk, you had my undivided attention. And there were so many great commentators when we were kids and there was so much less stuff to watch. Even uh, I think very unsung as a commentator is Vince McMahon. Like when you have Vince McMahon with Jesse Ventura or Vince with Gorilla, you know what I mean? It, there's That's a magic right. there. And when, and when you have the guy that writes the show on the call, you're able to call the show much better, I feel, because you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, yeah. you got it all undercover. So um, with, with Jim Ross and all these great people, I think just as the foundation of what wrestling commentary is, I think they're going to be somewhere in in anybody's work that's doing in this field but then there was guys like joey styles that i used to just watch religiously and he's so unsung and the fact that he would do it especially in those early days he would do all the commentary by himself um a feat that i've gotten to do a bunch of times it's not easy but it just to be able to do it joey styles style right. and then quite frankly the the icp guys like their commentary on stranglemania back in the day was very influential to me, like just that crazy over the top. It, it's kind of like the, I don't know, when I, I could picture it all in my mind, like the Vince McMahon hype and all that, the Joey Styles excitement and a little bit of the coarseness and the the everyman feel of I, the ICP stuff, maybe. I'm not sure. I never yeah, thought you, about it before. <laughs> you ne yeah, you never think about Vinny Mac as, as being a com to commentator. It's like really one of the, I mean, you're right. He did it for so freaking long. You know, you forget about that aspect because you, you never think of him in that context. You know what I mean? Um, and of course, Gorilla and Bobby, of course, you know what yeah. I'm saying? There's so many no, greats. I get well, I mean, but those are the guys when you think of commentators, you think of Bobby the Brain, Gorilla Monsoon, Jim Ross, you know what I mean? And guys like now today, I think, you know, some, one of the best teams, you know, out there, and I, you probably agree with me, is D'Lo and Stryker. You know what I mean? Oh, they're great. I think they're great together. So I, I, I kind of want to, um, I just, I now I lost track of my question, but I'm going to get there. I promise. I, I guess, um, oh, this is what I want to talk about. The forbidden door. 
right? And now it seems like it could be closing, you know what I mean? And we've seen guys like Moxley come in to GCW, who's primarily known for being with an, as an AD, AEW talent. He's coming in, he's holding your belt, right? Um, you got guys like, uh, you know, Cardona coming in from Impact, you know, the list goes on, right? So what do you, what is your personal take on this? I mean, for me, it's like the, the, the new golden age of, of wrestling. And I love yeah. it. I love everything that happens with it. So for me, like as a wrestling fan, it's like the best thing that could happen. I want your take on it. I, I couldn't agree more. I feel like I've been feeling like it's the the boom period for the, at least the last two or two years ish. And now I, I think, like you said, it's the golden age. And a lot of that comes down to, I mean, look, and this isn't a knock on, on ring of honor. Obviously their whole situation is unfortunate, but just as an example, uh, Ring of Honor people, for the most part, the majority of them were not allowed or not contractually able, you know, to work anywhere else, uh, where Impact took a more updated approach of, hey, we need you for these dates. You know what I mean? If you want to go do other stuff, we're not going to fucking stop you. And that that opens the door to people like Cardona. You know what I mean? Um, that then with Ring of Honor did open the door to the Briscoes. So I think um, companies like AEW, Impact and others have that more modern approach where they, they look at it as if GCW runs a show the night before our show, it's not hurting us one iota. And I believe quite frankly, the fact that if there is a GCW show and an AEW show or whatever other show, there are people that are going to come to town who weren't originally coming to the big events, but they would come for GCW and they would also go there. Conversely, some new people would come from the other way, but I don't think it really hurts anybody. And I think the more people are open to, letting everyone coexist and matt cardona is hotter as a property like i would imagine his podcast numbers are up his youtube numbers are up and the interest in his segments on impact are are up so it's like that's wild to think about that they in it's usually would be the other way around like oh i wish impact would mention gcw and give us a rub and that would be cool but in this case here's cardona getting all this great stuff and hopefully he can transfer some of that heat and magic into everything that's going on with impact. All right. I'm going to ask this question once again. I'm going to be very transparent that this is probably one of these questions designed to get hit. <laughs> but the forbidden I love this door, approach. I, I, I be in a well, I got to put forbidden door in a soundbite. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, the forbidden door is, you know, closing from what everybody's saying. Have you guys had any talks with like uh, John Moxie? Like, hey, uh, are you still able to work with us? What's going on? I, what have you guys heard from the GCW standpoint of, are we still allowed to use this guy or not? Well, I, I think I could sum it up uh, best like this. You know, everybody's worried about and talking about the forbidden door and who can walk through it and yada, yada, yada. At Game Changer Wrestling, I think we just focus primarily on driving people through the fucking forbidden door, shattering the forbidden door into a million splinters letting the pieces fall where they may. And then maybe Nick Gage will pick up some of the pieces and stab you with them, allegedly. So uh, I haven't heard anything regarding that. And I know the gold sits around the waist of John Moxley. And I think, uh, as I've said on commentary before, I think John Moxley goes where John Moxley wants to go. Yeah. And I think, especially with the launch of his amazing new book, I think he wants to be a part of Game Changer Wrestling. But, yeah, I mean, that's I, just I, me I, talking. That's a good answer. <laughs> And it's obviously very, on large face made it all worth yeah, it yeah well i i think i think it's whatever um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna blow up your spot but anyways um i i guess i guess if i had <laughs> so I, I always know when some motherfuckers hold some cards to his chest you know what i mean <laughs> anyway switzerland and that's totally there. yeah and that's totally fine okay so <clears throat> is there any talent okay i i mentioned ninja mac now, Unreal is, it's mind blowing what this guy can do. It's literally yeah. freaking, it's, it's so mind blowing. And I mean, it's, it's, it's next level. I can't believe it. It's, it's the one thing that I've seen that has made me excited. Okay. That's not even the question. I just needed to say that, get it out. Get it out there. Ninja Mac, he'll clip this and put it on his new YouTube page. Well, I mean, he's the best, man. He, I mean, he's just nuts. Is there one guy 
or two guys or three guys that you'd like to see come through GCW's doors? If so, who would that be? And, you know, and uh, is it, could it, could it be come back through GCW's doors as well? Like Ooh. it could be, it could be whatever you want it to be. Like if, you know, cause I mean, like we said, I mean, I want, we sort of laid the foundation with the forbidden door. Sure. Who's coming in? Well, Who's coming in? The first one that comes to mind as soon as you said it is Brody King. I think Brody King is awesome and has, uh, you know, unlimited upside and he's just such a, a monster and so unique in what he does and whatever. Uh, to me, he would be a, a natural fit. Uh, he has appeared uh, just, I know he wrestled Hardcore Holly once. He maybe has a handful of GCW appearances, but uh, not too many, if, if beyond that one. Um, who else right now is great? Uh, I would have to think for a second. Let's see. Other people I would want to see in GCW. Uh, so many of them come through. Let's see. Oh, you might have stumped me on this one. Wow, I got you to shut up. This is fucking insane. <laughs> wow. Oh, it's great God. For podcast, on- honestly, when everybody's <laughs> quiet. <laughs> There's some so much great talent out there, but I feel like a lot of them. I mean, uh, what's his name? We had. Um, uh, fuck. Great Muda booked. And then uh, that didn't work out. So I would love to see Muda come through and uh, just to have that moment, you know what I mean, of Muda. Well, why not have it? I mean, because the one guy that I expected to see on the my GCW screen in the last year is a guy like Jun Kasai. Oh, God, yeah. that That's just the... um you know, the uh, dealing with COVID and travel restrictions and stuff. Uh, June has many times graced the GCW ring. And uh, I would right. imagine, uh, I think, I don't know if he had taken a little bit of time off as well, but I think that as soon as he's ready and now that you're seeing uh, some of the Japanese talent starting to return stateside for GCW, uh, I'm hoping it won't be too, too long before we see Mr. Kasai uh, back in the States. Because, yeah, he he's an absolute god. And there's so yes. many greats from BJW and uh, uh, over at Shinkiba First Ring and all that, that are such a, such great talent at Freedoms. Um, there's, there's a lot of great Japanese talent I'm ready to see come back. And right. new talent that hasn't debuted yet. Right. One of my dream guests on this podcast is Ron Funches, who we've talked about. <laughs> yes. Yeah. One of my all-time man. people. I love whatever podcast he's on or what he's doing. He is one of the most amazing guys that you just want to walk up and hug. And yes, Ron, if you ever get to watch this dream interview for me, by the way. So hi. Um, how for you, who is a seasoned vet, you sit next to a guy, Ron, who has mic skills, but ultimately is a fan. How hard is it for you to drive the bus while letting Ron be Ron while still controlling the show? Oh, to me, not hard at all. Like Ron is such a, such a pro, you know what I mean? And I think when you're a television pro, a voiceover pro, a movie pro, a stand-up comedy pro, it's easy to then just, you know what I mean? And someone who watches wrestling, you know what I mean? Some people you have to kind of give them the Iggy, like, you know, stop talking over the ring announcer or, you know, these other little things that they might do. But someone like him, he, he's so into wrestling that it's just like Lars, you know what I mean? There was no, um, there's no like, oh, Lars here, let me give you a few pointers about commentary. Do you know what I mean? Right. It, it kind of just happens that everybody's everybody's in their lane, but changing lanes, you know, to intermingle the, the flow of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, because that's one of the things I noticed with uh, when, when, okay, so how, uh, I need to ask this question. How fucking cool was it to do commentary with Nick Foley? Oh my God, dude. Uh, so great story about that. And I call this the, um, like it's the power of positive social media. So the moment that Mick Foley was announced uh, to be at this game changer show, someone had tweeted like out and they said, Oh, I want Mick Foley to be on commentary with KG for Moxley versus Gage. So I, of course, immediately, well, first I didn't immediately do it because it was very late at night. I waited until prime time hours and then I retweeted it. <laughs> and then a, a few other people retweeted it and whatever. And then, you know, this is like maybe a week before the event. So uh, in tribute to the spirit of, you know, flying by the seat of your pants and how GCW works, it's like, I don't know, maybe 
four o'clock the day of the show or something. And I say to Brett, I'm like, Hey Brett, uh, I don't know what you have planned for Mick tonight besides the, um, you know, the, the presenting of the belt, but does it interfere with what you have planned? If we maybe have him do commentary for the main event. And Brett's like, Oh, I would love to have him do commentary. If you think he's down to do it, just see, see what's up when he gets here. So I'm like, all right. So then I'm just waiting. You know what I mean? Like waiting for Mick Foley to arrive. So when Mick Foley arrives, he walks in and Brett's the first person he sees. And Mick's like, hey, Brett, can I do commentary with KG for the main event? <laughs> I think it would be a good addition. So uh, that's I found that out later because then as, so as soon as I saw Mick, I went over to him and I'm like, hey, Mick, how do you feel about it? He's like, doing commentary with you on the main event? It's done. So wow. that it makes it even even sicker. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I walked into his dressing room to ask him that. And then he's like, you know, pull up a chair. And then I. I literally sat with Mick Foley right up until like they did like the we go live in 60 seconds or whatever. And then I, I ran out to the table. But such a thrill. I mean, I love Mick Foley. Mick Foley's on my Mount Rushmore of pro wrestlers. And he harkens back to, you know, the Bruiser Brodies of the world. And he kind of transitioned between the old school and then, you know what I'm saying? The modern era. And oh, my God, like everything Mick Foley did and is is gold to me. So to even know the guy is an honor to be able to work with them is yeah. Like you, you have these experiences. One funny thing. Uh, <laughs> so we're doing the main event and uh, something, the crowd's going insane. I forget what moment was happening. And I just say something and Mick gives me like a joking elbow. And it's like, he does like a Vince, he does an impression of Vince McMahon screaming into your headset. And just as like, Dang it, let it breathe. You know what I mean? Uh, but he did it as a joke. You know what I mean? So that after the show, he's like, hey, KG, I hope you know I was kidding. I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. And he's like, but Vince McMahon did that to me. He goes, oh, I, I, I better, <laughs> I don't want to speak out of school. But uh, he, the, the point of it, and I lost the whole point of it. The point of it was that he did this thing that Vince would do to yell at him to make him stop talking. But he just wanted to do it, but he didn't want me to stop talking. So it was like a funny, <laughs> uh, a, to me, a, a very funny moment. You know what I mean? And and uh, he had said, since I started to say it, one time he was calling SmackDown the first time Vince said this to him. And they were having Vicky Guerrero and Edge do a slow dance in the ring. And Mick Foley said it went on for over three minutes. And there's just silence. And then Mick like, starts to say something like, what a beautiful moment. And then Vince is just like, damn it, pal. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and it, and it Vince like, I got to say something just to, are we on the air? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I got to keep some kind of energy or connection. But anyway, but yeah, Mick Foley, the, the god, man. I, I love that guy and uh, a true asset to the business on, on every level. And, and someone who, the moment that show started, even with his uh, well-documented knee and hip issues, he stood at the curtain, watched every match on the show. And he, too, was completely blown away by Ninja Mac. All right. We're he down, has good we're, taste. We're down yes. to one more question apiece. And I, I, I'll i be honest. Uh, we ask a lot of the wrestlers this one. And since you and I are kind of talkers, uh, you're probably on a higher stage than I am. And well, look who you're with, brother. You got to, you're surrounded not just by the talent that's here today, but the talent that's here on the regular and my ego, team the episodes. And, my and ego. your ego, which has, which has its own dressing room and its own private plane. It does. It actually does a follow-up podcast uh, to this <laughs> podcast, believe it or not. And after show, yeah, like call-ins and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I will go back and listen to every podcast and, and take notes like, oh, I should have said this, or I should have let it breathe, or – Oh, I feel like I step. And and I kind of want to believe that you're kind of like me, where you want to go back and listen to yourself and not so much as the egotistical, but take notes and and what you could do. And we asked the wrestlers this, and I'm gonna ask you this. What it, do you think is your most perfect commentary show that you've done from from match one to the end, where you thought everything was perfect in this match? I I was amazing. I highlighted, I stepped back. What was for you, your your hmm. ring top one pay per view show, whatever it was that you've done, where you were on from the moment the green light hit to the red light. Wow, that's a really great question, and I do I do watch all the shows back, and I do listen to appearances back and stuff like you said for the those same reasons. 
and a lot of the time, ninety nine percent of the stuff I say, I have no recollection of. Uh, so when I watch the shows, a lot of it, it's like I'm hearing it for the first time. So it's informative for me. But man, overall, uh, I saw several people that don't like me say that my recent show in Atlantic City was my best work ever uh, for Game Changer Wrestling. So I don't know if that should count for something. Um, I think of things like uh, we did uh, two nights in Corican Hall in Japan. Oh, no, I'm sorry, at Shinkiba First Ring in Tokyo. And uh, I called those shows mostly by myself. And just to be in Tokyo calling a show and they're like these kind of like shorter, maybe six match shows, 90 minutes, those I would feel like on fire because it was just all go, all killer from the jump. But, oh man. So maybe the most recent show, which now I, I need to put a name on, it was, um, can you help me out here, Lars? What did we just do in Atlantic City? Uh, well, uh, Jesus, why are you doing this oh, to me? Oh, uh, with Moxley and... Uh, uh, Moxley uh, and... Oh. Uh, not the LA show. <laughs> no. Box. Well, when you see the amount of dates we have coming up, you'll understand. But I would say uh, the most recent show in New Jersey in Atlantic City. And uh, I'm a big fan. I feel like, for me, a big moment uh, of establishment or something that uh, kind of gave me a lot of confidence was the night that David Arquette came to wrestle at GCW in Los Angeles, which is going back a little bit. And uh, that show I got to call the opening match, which was a great, a great Sasuke versus DJZ. And it was amazing. And uh, it was one of those things, it was unclear what matches I was gonna be calling. So I'm just waiting at Gorilla to find out. But now it's like one minute till showtime and I still don't know what matches I'm calling. And, uh, and uh, DJZ comes up and it's like, hey, Brett, can KG call my match? And Brett's like, yeah, sure. And it's, it's DJ Z versus Sasuke. So I'm like, oh, my God. And it's match one. So I go through the curtain, and Brett's like, oh, we'll send out other commentators. We'll rotate you on and off. We'll have guests come out. And basically, no one ever came out, and I, I, except for when Sean from the Hot Tub came out for one match. But other than that, I just called the whole show myself, and I felt like that was – and maybe it was an oversight, but to me it was like the huge – uh like kg you're the man like you could call an entire fucking show by yourself with celebrities on it and shit so that always uh uh to live and die in la that always stands out to me as well but uh yeah well you know i i think that you can you know i mean i think you're the man honestly and especially with this company i think you fit right i think you know the talent enough and i think you have a personality um you know I either anyways is there one person you know my last question because I know you've 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 met many a wrestler and I know you've forgotten more about pro wrestling than you can remember and that's and I just know that about you is there one person in your life that you've met in professional wrestling that was the polar opposite of what you thought and so it's a two-part question and who is one of the ones that sticks out the most Besides Mick Foley? Uh, in a way, one of the ones that surprised me the most, well, I was going to say Bret Hart, but I think I have to swerve and say the one that surprised me even a little bit more than Bret Hart was Jeff Jarrett. Jeff mm. Jarrett was someone that, who, you know, growing up when I grew up and watching TV when I watched it, um, I wasn't a fan of him. Like, granted, he was presented as a heel and pushed as a heel, designed to be unlikable. But I was just like, ah, fuck that guy. I don't like, I don't like him. And I didn't really like his matches or whatever. And uh, I met him one night and hung out with him a bit. And he he was just the most charismatic, self-deprecating. Like I always pictured him as this like ego-filled guy, like all this political manipulations to make himself the center of the show. And then you meet the guy and talk to him and he's so cool and so down to earth and so the opposite of how he's presented that he's always endeared himself to me just in how kind and again, self-deprecating and just cool he was, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and just down, like I, I was very uh, pleasantly surprised by that. Wow. How and was yours, they... Lars? Oh shit. Well, I probably Bret Hart, you know, because just the, you know, getting to know him and then, and then not only, but then personally like going to hockey games with him, 
going out to the dinner with him, him making me one of his paintings, you know, like just oh all this God. stuff. Oh my God, I didn't know you had one of his paintings. Yeah, I have an original. And You have to send uh, me a photo later, please. I will, I will. But I mean, it's it's just like, it's that that's kind of thing. Cause that, you know, that as a kid, I loved him. You know, and I, and I think a lot of people at the time, you know, this is when wrestling was changing. So it wasn't, you know, you either loved Bret Hart or you kind of hated him. You know what I mean? Yeah, it wasn't- I love him. I love him too. Um, but yeah, the other part of my question was, um, who, 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 what was your greatest experience meeting a wrestler or anybody in the business? Man, just so many people have been so good to me. Uh, you got to pick one, able... Kev. You got to pick one. And what was the criteria? What the best person I met, or how did you say it? Well, whatever. I mean, you know what? We can end the fucking show if you want. If you want to skirt around hey, this how one about too. That? How about that? No. <laughs> But say, how did you phrase it? I just want to uh, put it into. Well, I guess I, I, what I wanted to hear was like the guy that you least expected to be cool, right? And okay. like we got that in Jeff Jarrett, and then now the guy that like you, who you've always wanted to meet, and then you meet him, and it was just as cool. Ooh, yeah, I, I'm totally. I this this is the type of stuff that always freezes me up. Well, you're letting them, you're, you're letting it breathe. You're definitely letting it breathe. I would say there's been a lot of people that, oh, ah, At this just point, give me one. Name. Just make Sean up a name. X Pac Waltman. Ah, a world class human being, absolute standout guy, but he's on a list of many uh, great people. CM Punk is on that list, um, et cetera. But yeah, there's so you know. Shout out to Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, or Roddy Piper. You know what I mean? I, to me, it's unreal. Greg the Hammer Valentine. The fact that I ever got to work with any of these people, it blows my mind. You know? Right. Got it. Cool. That's all. I was like, "That's ruining the end of the show, bro." We're gonna have to fucking edit that now. <laughs> I don't worry. We're all gonna catch pauses. You on the what show. is this shit? <laughs> <laughs> Brett, you, don't, don't worry about it. Long, we're gonna, this, it's going to be a special about Lars and his Bret Hart painting that I didn't even know he had. <laughs> that is the rest of the show. Believe it or not, when people actually go back and watch this, it's just going to be me and Lars. They're like, were they talking to somebody else this whole show? And you're going to cut it out the whole time. But There's no, going to be like a little sticker over your face. Your name's going to be marked out. You, you won't even, you will know. Well, you know, I'm super stoked to have you, Kev. I mean, it's been a long time coming. We've been talking about getting you on for a minute. I'm, thank you for making the time for us, man. Super cool to talk to you and get your perspective. After all, this is the wrestling perspective. So thanks, Kev. Really wait, appreciate wait, it, buddy. Wait, where can people what, what find you, you Kev? Yeah, yes. Oh, Tell us, <laughs> give us your list of dates. Uh, okay, first I'd like to say shout out to you guys. Thank you both so much for having me. Uh, very, uh, something I've been looking forward to for a long time. Um, follow and support Game Changer Wrestling. A great way to support is Game Changer, or sorry, patreon.com slash Game Changer Wrestling. There's exclusive podcasts, one which uh, has featured Lars as a guest. There's all sorts of behind the scenes access and gimmicks and all that shit. It's a great way to support. And of course, I'm on social media at OG Kevin Gill, and I have a Twitch, Kevin Gill, and I take tips on Twitter. So send me your motherfucking money and keep this fucking <laughs> high energy water flowing. But in the meantime, maybe some of these dates have passed by now. But bask in the knowledge that November 12th, GCW returns to Detroit. November 13th is That's Chicago. That's my birthday. Hang on. Tell me. Tell really? Me. You're coming to Detroit on my birthday. On November 12th. Yes. November with, 12th is my birthday. Featuring some wrestlers from Japan as well. I, I'm, I have to go to the show. We're the Please come to the VIP show. birthday tickets. Well, you just hit, get my number from Lars. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. I, I am in. I'm going to bring a date. I'm going to make a woman come. Not actually. And then she's also going to attend yeah, the event I'm going to make well. her go wrestling. She won't come that night, trust me. <laughs> but she will go to watch wrestling. And then I will, I'll will get like fake VIP tickets and you can be like, oh, my God, you're Dennis Farrell. I'd be like, yeah, I am. And then she'll be like, oh, my gosh, you're cool. The, I, Maybe this, get the ring announcer to acknowledge you. That might get, get, uh, get some things moving. Hang on. Uh, my ego is knocking <laughs> at the door right now. <laughs> we could do it. Continue, continue, yes, Kev. Yes, please. But then uh, December 3rd and 4th, it's Houston and Dallas. December 17th, it's back to L.A. New Year's Eve, where else? But the legendary Showboat Hotel in Atlantic City. A double shot because we'll be back on New Year's Day as well. And then, of course, the day that everyone's been talking about, 
January 23rd, Game Changer Wrestling makes its historic debut at the Hammerstein Ballroom wow. in New York City. Unfucking precedented. And all those shows are on Fight TV. So if you want to support, uh, they're quite reasonably priced. And uh, a lot of the weekends uh, will have like package prices. So you can just get in on all of it. And uh, don't forget, Chicago is the home of the Nick Cage Invitational. It's going to be a lot of pizza cutters, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of crazy glue being used as a surgical tool. I'm going to try to come out for that one. Really? Yes. I got to oh, see. Shit. I got to. You know, I don't. I don't think I've ever seen Nick Gage perform live. I've, it's always been on TV through video. You know, because CZW never ran over here, and then he Correct. goes to prison, and then you know, GCW for whatever fucking reason won't come to the Bay Area. <laughs> so, I I just I tried. A, I just noticed the double standard where it was like, oh my gosh, you're Detroit. It's my birthday. You're like, yeah, whatever. Lars is like, oh, hey, come out to Chicago. You're like, what? Oh my gosh. Lars, <laughs> I well, immediately offered you VIP and a shout out from the yes, big announcer. That's right. <laughs> just fake it. I think you're just glossing over my contributions. Just fake it. Just fake it. But just it's like, okay. I'm used to it, Dennis. I'm used to it. There you go. It's like, Dennis Farrell might come to one of my shows. <laughs> I know you've never heard of me up until eight minutes ago. Not even at the beginning of the podcast. You're like, who's this jabroni? It's Lars and some other guy. Well, sir, you are a world a world class host, and that's not me blowing smoke. You can tell the way you hold it down, and Lars does not associate with any J Bros. That's right. Well, not yet. It, it's still early in this podcast run. Well, I, I'm about to wrap it up because yes, you can't. Wrap it you up. have the you, know, okay, you wrap it up tonight. Okay, <laughs> we're, I'll tell you what. We're fucking done. Goodbye. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>